Okay. Uh, this is uh, uh, April t uh, 10th, and it's, uh, this, uh, it's about 7 o'clock ish or so. This is a makeup uh, uh, class, like makeup lecture, if you will, for ECE 3030. Um, it's spring quarter 2013, uh, spring semester 2013. And so, what this lecture is going to fit into the whole sequence is this is the uh, applications of diodes. We talked about the physics of diodes and then um, in this circular curriculum I was kind of referring to where, where you touch upon a subject uh, two or three different times and you're looking at it from different perspectives and gives you an opportunity to finally put everything together. So uh, let me remind you, we talked about uh, junctions, PN junctions and even metal semiconductor junctions and, and uh, the last part, hetero junctions. Um, and then we talked about deviations from ideality is what I call it, where we look at the IV characteristics of, a, of an ideal diode and we see all those permutations that cause these little fluctuations in the IV characteristics. That we've covered so far in the formal lecture. This is the applications of diodes, so this is the third and last time to touch upon all the fundamental physics. I touched upon a little bit of this uh, in, in class in the formal lecture this, of this first page here. Um, and uh, just to warn you, I think I actually uh, got really ambitious and I have 160 slides. So uh, I'll see the people who are here live can tell me when they want to cut me off. Um, but uh, not all of them have to be exhaustively uh, analyzed. But um, we covered a little bit of this in, in lecture, but for completeness and comprehensiveness, I'm going to cover it again. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to start off with is the PN junction diodes. Okay, let's say well, I want to use it for a rectifier uh, application. Okay, so an ideal diode as a rectifier, you know, rectifies the current, meaning that it allows it to pass as a short circuit in one direction and an open in the reverse. So we want it to have this characteristic where the IV characteristic is such that it's flat and completely uh, blocking all current um, and that in the forward it's almost as short as possible. Now that is not uh, practical when you think about a real diode, but we can come close to it. So uh, I'm going to go over this a little more quickly because I already did this in the lecture. Um, so if I want to minimize the reverse saturation current, and I think this is being recorded, this section of the board, so let me use this. Um, so we have our normal, di our ideal diode, basically following, um, let me see, is this, yeah, I think this far is, is recorded. Uh, I0 exponential of QV over KT minus one, square brackets. Okay. So Q, Q times the voltage over KT minus one and the exponential. So a normal, an ideal diode follows this, follows this uh, uh, characteristic. And then in the, if I have a small piece of chalk, no, I'll just, I'll just wing it. Um, and then we said in a real diode, it does something like this and does something like this, and then it starts to bend over, and then it, and so I was talking about a deviation there, deviation there, deviation there, deviation here, you know, two deviations there, I think I got them all, I might have missed one, and um, so, obviously this sags uh, in the higher reverse, so if we look at the fundamental physics of why it sags, um, it's the it's the collection of the generation of the of the carriers that are uh, being generated thermally generated by the generation recombination statistics in or near the depletion region. And remember, that's why this linearly increased because we're linearly increasing the depletion region. It grows as the uh, uh, reverse bias grows. And I even showed one of those uh, Java applets that shows that. Um, I'm not going to do it for time's sake uh, tonight. So therefore, this is generated, pun intended, by the generation statistics. So how do I suppress the generation statistics? 
The generation statistics are the carriers that are uh, get thermally hot and jump from the conduct from the valence band to the conduction band. So they have to gain the band gap energy. So therefore, if I make a wider band gap material, then it has to gain more thermal energy and it's more off limits, it's more out of reach. So therefore, um, it's going to suppress the reverse saturation current and it's going to bring this saggy curve, it's going to bring it more towards the origin. And so wider band gap means, of course, lower intrinsic carry concentration, uh, lower generation current uh, uh, statistics, lower I naught. So the I naught actually even gets smaller too. So that's going to bring it up. Then some of these things that caused it to fl flop over was related to the series resistance of the device. And here what I'm talking about is reducing power losses in the forward is basically just make a lot of power devices for semiconductors are big devices or lots of area so that the absolute for so that the current density going through the device is small essentially a diode might I actually I hope this is showing up on this on the uh, uh, video a diode may actually be a mesa that is etched onto a semiconductor wafer um, and so it may be etched as a as a as a, um, as a as a mesa, like Mesa, Arizona, as this pillar sticking up. And you may have even seen something like that uh, near the, on the posters outside my office. So <clears throat> what if I, so the current is going vertically through this device that may actually be epitaxially grown or maybe fashioned by the diffusion process we, 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 we uh, discussed and, and calculated. So if I make this device wider, you know, the diameter. I open it up. It's, it's basically like going from a garden hose to, uh, to, a, to a real, you know, fireman's hose, right? A larger diameter allows more current to go through with less resistance. So therefore, if I increase the area of the device, I reduce the resistance, and so those I squared R losses drop because essentially I'm dropping my R. So therefore, the parasitics are dropped. Also, if you remember um, contacts and things like that, we want to highly dope them to make them uh, very, uh, 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 to, to, to reduce series resistance. And I want a high breakdown voltage because I don't want this breakdown, which is either Zener or Avalanche, I don't want that happening too early. I want to have for this, um, for this rectifier application, I want this to be fairly open circuit for a, lo for a long time, as long as I can. I can't uh, make it indefinite, but, um, but I'd want to try and delay it as much as possible and, and delay its useful uh, operational range. So again, by going to a wider band gap, if you remember the cause and effect of, of avalanche breakdown, um, that was when the carriers got hot, got, got accelerated, and to the point uh, that they would knock a carrier out. And again, it was gaining the, the band gap voltage, the band gap energy to, to create an electron hole pair, right? It was avalanche breakdown. So one hot carrier, one accelerated carrier by the high electric field in the drift, you know, dr drift within the electric field and uh, depletion region uh, accelerated and kicked out. Uh, and so, Wider band gap, again, brings that out of reach. So it means it can attain a higher critical field and go to a larger voltage. Also, I think you did one homework problem that's turned in already, is uh, use a one-sided junction. So if you remember that, there's one curve if, if, when we talked about um, that I have in the slide deck for the uh, uh, diodes, for, uh, for the deviations of ideality. Um, and that was showing that the doping determines the breakdown voltage for avalanche. And a lighter doped material had a higher breakdown voltage. So if you actually make a one-sided junction, very little field is contained in the, um, high, in the highly doped uh, layer, and all the field is contained pretty much in the, uh, in the um, uh, lower doped. Essentially, if you remember, that would be where the electric field might peak and then go like that. So this would be the low, 
and this would be the high. And you can see it's very abbreviated in the highly doped region, so this would be looking at electric field, and this would be a function of x. So the low doped is where most of the electric field is housed. This is so short. You remember the analogy I gave in class about, or actually I think it was one of the videos, where the way you create that avalanche multiplication is you accelerate. And I think I gave the analogy of trying to knock your kid's sister out of bumper cars at Cedar Point. You need to accelerate all the way to the point that you hit the car, knock someone out, like your little kid's sister, and ionize her and create an electron hole pair. Well, because the highly doped has very little electric field, this is almost, almost uh, the Debye length in the worst case scenario, it's too short. The runway is too short. You can't get, enough, get up enough speed to cause an ionizing event. Essentially, that's all it is. The runway distance is so short that you're starting to slow down by the time you get uh, to, to a point that you might be ionizing. But over here, uh, that's where you have a longer path length, but the lower doping is bringing the electric field down to a more modest uh, value. Okay, switching diodes. Um, we pretty much, I hope, beat that to death somewhat. And that was those uh, minority carrier distributions that were going, doing this tail wagging at either side of the edge of the depletion region. And so if you remember, we were waiting in the turn off mode we are waiting for the carriers to disappear. And the carriers disappearing is at a very slow rate. It's just how quickly the recombination takes place. And recombination is a statistically random process. You just have to wait so many time constants. So to reduce the switching time, I can either make the, the, the carrier lifetime very short, um, or I can store very little charge, if you remember if you remember that, you were nominally uh, increasing, and then you were going, so this was like the forward, forward bias and reverse, and this was the N naught, and this was the P, uh, P naught, or actually P N naught and N P naught, say. And then this was the forward, and this was the reverse, right? And so this was the equilibrium value, and it was these two tails wagging up and down between a forward bias junction, where the majority carriers were piling over the top, or minority carrier extraction was the terminology I used, where it went dipped below in reverse bias, and then the unbiased was the flat. Okay, so if you uh, vaguely remember that, if I put it in forward bias, say, let's say I'm forward biasing one volt, this would be the minority carrier charge on the edge. But if I, say, ratchet it up to one and a half to two volts, I'm actually gonna put more charge on either side. And so then, if I have double the current, I'm gonna have double the charge and that means if I want to make a switching diode, I have to remove all this. So therefore, my starting point is higher. It takes longer for me to get rid of all that Q, all that charge. So that's all I'm saying here is that store little charge, as little charge as possible, by not over overdriving it, essentially. Don't push it to really high forward current. If you want to make a digital switch uh, out of it, you want to just gently you know, move it just to the on state, but putting it more than on doesn't help you. It hurts you. The other is the carrier lifetime, and we were talking about that actually in, in, elect, in the live lecture this morning, as traps, you know, adding recombination centers, or sometimes I use the analogy stepping stones to cross a stream. Uh, that maybe near mid-band gap, that's where they're the most dangerous. Add that to the material, this kills, that's a K by the way, kills the carrier lifetime, the tau P's, the tau N's, everything, all the carrier lifetimes die. So also make it, make it lightly doped to neutral region uh, because shorter than the minority carrier diffusion length. So if we have a narrow base diode, then the stored charge is also small since the majority carriers can diffuse to the end of the contact. 
Uh, I'm not sure do I have a visual of that. Essentially, that's a little harder to draw, but I think I can pull it off. Oh, no, here. You can do this. Think of this being representative of a piece of semiconductor. <clears throat> and this would be, say, the metallurgical junction. I think I made this N, so make this P-type and make this N-type. And so the depletion region is nominally here, as it ma as maps onto here. So this uh, minority carrier distribution is coming, uh, is, is, is doing this in this region of physical space, in the N region. Depletion region's here. And this is the unionized, you know, this is outside the depletion region. This is just N-type bulk material. Bulk is the term, if you haven't caught that, is what I mean by outside the depletion region. So the, the, uh, this minority carrier distribution is happening in this physical space. And so if I make a narrow base diode, what I mean by that is what if my diode is actually thinner? and I put my metal contact right here, then if that, uh, that this waveform is coming and hitting here, it hits the metal semiconductor contact. Remember, hopefully that's a nice ohmic contact, low resistance ohmic contact. It basically slams into this wall of this uh, ohmic contact at the surface of the semiconductor, and it also kind of eliminates the amount of area under that curve that is being stored. In fact, actually, this acts like a siphon, like a hole in the bottom of a bucket, <coughs> and it pulls it out more quickly. So it keeps the Q that would normally, if it was fully, if it was a very long device, from, from, from establishing as much. So that's what I mean by that. Um, OK. So switching diodes, so you're either killing the amount, uh, you know, reducing the amount of charge, the Q, or you're, um, because you remember the, the differential equation I showed you is basically Q over tau. That's really all you're trying to do. So if you want to make it fast, you either reduce the Q or, um, or, or, um, or kill the carrier lifetime. Now, if you want to make a breakdown diode, so by either a Zener or Avalanche, you can design the device with a specified breakdown voltage. And I think you kind of, we saw that one curve. You can basically use uh, any, you know, by judicious selection of the doping and so forth, I can basically determine if I know my band gap and I know my doping, I can probably pretty much on that one curve uh, pick off what the breakdown voltage is. So therefore, if I have a circuit and I have, um, uh, like, like, you know, uh, when I go on one of these trips and I'm over the, uh, overseas with my laptop and I plug my laptop into a 210 volt outlet, why doesn't it get fried? Well, it probably has, one, for one thing, a, sense, uh, a sensing circuit to detect the, uh, the, the voltage, but it also probably has a regulator of some sort to make sure that the voltage that this laptop circuitry is seeing is capped. It's a, there's a, that beyond a certain limit, no further voltage is allowed to be held or my whole laptop would be fried. So you can specify where that is, let's say the 15 volts, by, by, uh, by the proper selection of, whether, of what kind of doping and so forth for the avalanche or the zener. So you can basically have a voltage regulator. So if this knee where the breakdown happens is extremely sharp, then it can take any amount of current. It can take a half an amp, one amp, five amps. You know, it kind of like has a, it's like a fuse, if you will, that instead of, uh, you know, normal fuse when you have your circuit breaker is, 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 is blowing when the current goes too high. This is, in some sense, blowing when the voltage gets too high. That's all, right? It's just going to keep it that independent of current, it's going to hold that voltage, in this case, minus 15. So it's a voltage regulator. Current can change significantly without appreciable change to the voltage, because avalanche uh, and zener is very, very abrupt. 
Now the last thing I'll talk about of, the, of this genre is the varactor diode. And we talked about uh, junction capacitance being able to be modulated, the extra charge at the edge of the depletion region. And so I can modulate the junction capacitance with voltage. So therefore, junction capacitance is variable with either abrupt metallurgical junction or a linearly graded metallurgical junction. I can have a, a specified current, uh, sorry, capacitance voltage relationship of a known value, and I can design uh, the capacitance voltage, but depending upon the doping profile, I can design within some reason uh, how that uh, performs by engineering the junction. And so therefore I can have, uh, build this into tuning circuits and so forth, where I'm changing the, changing the capacitance, which can change the frequency. Right? Think of a tuning circuit and RC time constant associated with it. I can actually tune uh, my FM radio through different frequencies. Okay. So uh, the next thing is nice. Uh, it's uh, actually talking about some of the work that I do behind the scenes that you probably don't know about. Fit, fit, uh, fit visible. No, fit. Ah, okay. Whoops. Fit. I don't know why this is making it so small. Um, okay, let's do it that way. So, uh, this is a tunnel diode, and I'll explain the physics of that. It's a, it's a diode that normally our diode goes up, you know, and increases exponentially. So it hits that knee, that cut-in voltage, and it increases uh, exponentially. But what if I have a diode that instead of increasing and then come going up exponentially, that's what this portion is, it has this extra hump. And I can do some very interesting things, and this is one of the areas of, of my own research. And so uh, some of the figures of merit is taking this peak and uh, the valley and, make, and doing a quotient, calling a peak to valley current ratio. And the other is the peak current density, taking the uh, peak current value absolute and dividing by the area of the device and coming up with a current, specified current density. Okay, so uh, uh, with those definitions, this is the Asaki tunnel diode for which Leo Asaki won the Nobel Prize. He did this actually as a PhD student in Japan. And uh, this is a figure out of uh, one of the uh, book chapter that my uh, former graduate student and I co-wrote. And, um, <clears throat> If you remember Fermi level, uh, Fermi level for everything we've showed you so far was always somewhere in between the conduction band and the valence band. We always had sort of a, you know, you would always see me draw, actually let me do a dashed, uh, Fermi level. Right. Fermi level was always flopping around in between the constraints of the conduction band and the valence band. If you look at the carrier, um, the, the, the equations for the relationship between a free carrier density, or doping, and the Fermi level, you'll see I have to, to get the uh, Fermi level close to the conduction band, it's almost like it's, it, it needs an exponentially larger and larger and larger amount of doping to get closer and closer. There's actually a very, one of those Java applets, if you click enough, there's a really cool Java applet that shows you how that is going back and forth. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time uh, going through that. This is the point where I've kind of uh, really hit the boundary limit of what Mother Nature allows me to do. And I've doped this so highly that the, uh, that the Fermi level is now actually inside the conduction band, and, the, and on the other side, the Fermi level's inside the valence band. It's exceeded the normal parameters. And so, therefore, you know, I've always talked about doping. Don't forget about doping in relation to, you know, I normally said doping ranges probably between, say, 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 18 per centimeter cubed. 
And then if you calculate the density of silicon, I always kind of say it's roughly around the Avogadro's number. Generally, if you really think about it, I think the, the, one of the problems was around a little bit lower than the Avogadro's number, about 5 times 20 to 22 per centimeter cubed. This was the density of silicon of a, of a raw silicon crystal. You know, 5 times 10 to the 22 silicon atoms in a cubic uh, centimeter of, of uh, silicon. And if you put 10 to the 18 of a dopant, phosphorus or boron, doesn't matter, then what I'm saying is that 10 to the 18, you can see that I have one uh, dopant for every 10 to the 4 silicon atoms, right? So for every 10,000 uh, silicon atoms, I have one doping. When I get degenerate like that, the term is degenerate, so the, conduction, the uh, Fermi level is inside the conduction band. I am probably to the point that this doping is now getting into the ten, almost 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 21. In fact, when it gets to 10 to the 20, almost 20, 10 to the 21, if it really could get that high, which is kind of uh, unbelievable, usually maybe 5 times 10 to the 20, you can see it's almost uh, an alloy, you'd almost call it, because it would almost be 1% of the silicon is now boron or phosphorus. And so it's a very hard thing to do, and that's one of the things we've been, I've been working on for the last decade or so, is how to do that and do that abruptly. And if you remember the conditions for tunneling, I declared that once when we were talking about Zener tunneling. You know, I had to have available carriers, and I had to have uh, empty uh, energy states adjacent to it, and a small distance in between. This a Saki tunnel diode for which he won the Nobel Prize has that characteristics because I have this sail uh, that is representative, this green sail is representative of the electrons in the conduction band and they're opposite this, these holes in the valence band. In other words, it's like an air bubble. It's like uh, being on the Poseidon adventure and the fl ship flipped upside down and you got a big air bubble and and when this thing goes in, uh, gets biased, these, these electrons are tunneling into, now as it comes, this is uh, zero volts, so nothing interesting is happening. But as I'm starting to raise the voltage, you can see it's like two keyholes aligning. And I can shoot the arrow through. So I have the electrons these filled states, they're opposite these whole states, which is basically, you know, empty electrons uh, in, in this sim simplification. And so they start tunneling in, the current starts rising dramatically immediately with current, with, you know, with voltage. The current is, 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 and here you can see the two keyholes are perfectly aligned. And so the current maxes out. Then as the two keyholes misalign, the current starts to drop. And then over here, we know this. This is our normal thermal diffusion current. So this is the tunneling current, the peak tunneling current. Um, we end up with a third current component here uh, that, I prob that, that is related to the traps and so forth. And we get uh, um, sometimes they can be tunneling through, uh, inter uh, through, through traps, point defects, and stuff like that. So that kind of raises this. Um, I'm not going to uh, emphasize that in this class. And then we have the thermal diffusion. So it actually does this, it looks like the capital letter N. And that is a tunnel diode. Recognize also that in reverse, I have the opposite. I have the filled electrons actually below the whole states here. This is all filled electrons from the Fermi level on down. So as I go into reverse, I get basically get that what we declared as Zener tunneling. But the Zener tunneling happens immediately, and this is a short circuit. So I can actually have like Zener, essentially Zener tunneling at zero, zero volts. So because um, that thermal diffusion current kicks in at different cut-in voltages depending upon band gap, you can see here at 300 Kelvin, this is germanium, which is a low band gap, gallium antinamide, which is kind of a medium, and gallium arsenide. And so you can see how the tunneling, this is all normalized, by the way, uh, shifts out. So I can change my uh, dynamics by the different. Um, now, 
This is what an Asaki tunnel diode actually looks like uh, in modern day if you bought this from something uh, from uh, someplace. It actually is a piece of metal that is pushed onto a piece of silicon. This silicon is highly, highly doped, maybe P-type, maybe N-type. And this metal is, uh, has inside the metal uh, impregnated in it is, a, uh, is, the, is the dopant of the opposite species. And if you heat this up very, very uh, uh, abruptly, say if you could heat this up to 1,000 degrees and cool it down in 10 seconds, you know, heat it up, hold it for five, 10 seconds and cool it down really immediately, you would actually get the dopants of the opposite carrier type diffusing into this other highly doped. You would actually make a very shallow, abrupt uh, junction that would be, have a band diagram like I just showed you. This is something they did similar where they have P plus germanium, N plus germanium, and they actually put indium, which is a dopant actually, on the side of this, and, um, and uh, uh, indium's a dopant in germanium. And uh, they, they also flash center this very, very hot for very, very short. They make a very hyper abrupt junction. And the more abrupt it is, the more it's going to satisfy the short tunneling distance uh, for quantum mechanical tunneling. Okay. So. Here's Leo Osaki, by the way. Uh, we were together in, uh, two, in Shanghai in 2012. This is a conference I helped organize. He was one of the plenary speakers. He's still getting around and giving some nice uh, sp speeches. So he did that work, actually, as a PhD student in Japan. And here's the other tunneling device. Uh, this is if I could make you know, this quantum well uh, laser diode that I have you working on the project. You recognize it, it's a quantum well. I have, and here again, I'm, uh, in this particular case, I'm not worried about what's happening in the valence band. I'm only looking at the conduction band. So I have a confined state, like, like you're hopefully calculating your 980 pump laser uh, diode. And I have a wide band gap material that makes two barriers, two f so it's a finite quantum well. I have an electron state in between. Now, if I make an electrical diode out of this, if I have this doped and this doped, or maybe lightly doped, as I go and bias this, I will actually tunnel the two keyholes aligning again. I will get the carriers in the uh, side here uh, coming in from the contact, will actually tunnel through that quantum hole, uh, quantum well state. And so they quantum mechanically tunnel. It's kind of like a resonance. They call this a resonant tunnel diode. It quantum mechanically tunnels through that energy state, and I get a peak current. Then that energy state is actually very, very abrupt, very, very thin in energy space. And so as I uh, uh, bias it more, then tunneling through the, through the uh, quantum well state stops. I do get some excess current, which is basically uh, current that's going a, a circuitous route. Maybe it tunnels into a trap or something. This is basically a grab bag of a lot of the bad current that we don't want. That's kind of going through traps. And then eventually I can actually bend the band so abruptly that carriers may tunnel through the first barrier and then uh, like a thermal diffusion splatter over the top of the next barrier and, and becomes a normal thermal diffusion current. So you get the same characteristics as the uh, Asaki tunnel diode. The, uh, the only difference is that there's nothing preventing me from biasing it the other way and having the carriers tunnel from the right side through the quantum well. So I don't show it in this figure. This is a figure, another figure from our uh, book chapter. But I actually have a symmetric uh, negative, it's called a negative differential resistance. I actually have a symmetry to this device on the other side. Okay. So this is kind of what's, what's your, uh, the band diagram of a resonant tunneling diode where you have this, U, U, I think you're calling it, we're calling it U naught or so, this band, energy band in the quantum well. 
and this is what it's doing in the conduction band, this is what it's doing in the valence band, but uh, resonant tunneling diodes, RTDs, are unipolar devices. Either I'm going to have electrons tunneling through a quantum well state, maybe right around there, or I'm going to have holes tunneling through a hole state somewhere there. Either or. But generally, electrons are what you want because they're their lighter effective mass, so they uh, behave more, uh, uh, more, you know, uh, more reliably. Here's, again, kind of like your 980 pump laser. If I make my finite quantum well, I might have an E1, E2, E3, E4. I may actually, if I, uh, if I have a, a very large bar energy barrier in my heterojunction, I may actually have, and this is, and my L is uh, fairly abrupt, my, my well length, I could actually have four confined states. So this is telling me the transmission coefficient of when the carriers can quantum mechanically tunnel through, and you see these singularities. These singularities are representative of when the tunneling goes through the quantum well. So you can see I have a singularity at the n equals 1 state, I have the singularity at the n equals 2 state, I have a singularity at the n equals 3 state, and I have a singularity at the n equals 4. So actually, if this diode actually worked, I would have four humps in my characteristics. So, this is kind of what it looks like. Like your, again, your 980 pump laser, you choose an appropriate substrate, you choose your barrier, you choose your quantum well, this in this case is 4.5 nanometers, and that becomes your RTD, your resonant tunneling diode. And then you may have some contact. Here's your metal, your ohmic contact to the top, and then you, you make contact to it with a wire or whatever, and you make a contact to the back through a wire or whatever, and you're sending current vertically through this epitextual stack that was grown in, an ep in any one of the different epitaxial reactors. So again, uh, Ray Su uh, was standing physically right here about a year ago, gave a lecture at this podium, and he, if I, uh, so he and Leo Saki co-invented the resonant tunneling diode. Ray Su is an Ohio State alumni, uh, if you didn't know that. A lot of esteemed Ohio State alums. Uh, so he graduated from uh, Ohio State. I brought him back. Um, he's down in the Carolinas for a distinguished lecture. This is sponsored by the IEEE Electron Device Society, for which I'm the local chair. And um, here's, by the way, one of his, uh, during his talk, one of his slides. You can recognize the podium, by the way. Um, he's explaining, he was explaining to us the historical of when this discovery happened. And I'll try and read some of this off just a little bit in, in, in uh, uh, paraphrasing. But basically, it was very controversial when this RTD was discovered. And uh, so he went, basically, there was a competition between uh, Ian Gunn, who eventually developed, invented and developed a gun diode to make microwave oscillations, to make, to make um, uh, microwave energy for like radar, radio, or whatever. Um, and so uh, there was kind of a competition. These tunnel diodes could also be used for that. And so, uh, so uh, he went to us. So Ray Su went to Asaki and told him that he suggested to make only one period of a, of a gallium arsenide well with only two barriers of aluminum gallium arsenide to form a quantum well. And he thought that, it, and Ray Su thought it would work. And so he tried to convince. Ray Su was trying to convince Ian Gunn, one of their basically competitors at IBM Yorktown, uh, and, um, and, he, and, and um, uh, Ian Gunn said, uh, if, if you could do that, Ray, uh, Gunn was going to give full support to the Asaki Ray Su team to, to further develop their work. And so Ray Su was very excited and animated and came back and told Leo Asaki, um, who had actually not physically won the Nobel Prize by that time. The Nobel Prize was actually awarded a little bit later after this because his discovery of the, of his, of the Asaki tunnel dial was 59. I think this discovery of the RTD occurred in f around 1970 and then the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1973. And 
Um, and so Ray was very excited. Oh, Gunn's going to support us if we can demonstrate this result. And, uh, and basically, Osaki kind of shook his head and said, Ray, you're very naive because Gunn knew that this would phys uh, experimentally never succeed with those, uh, because there were going to be pinholes to the barrier. And so if you think about it, oops, uh, I went too far. I went to the end. If you think about it, this is, I think I specify, yeah, here. These barriers, in this case, are 2.5 nanometers uh, thick. So therefore, if there was a defect, a pinhole, if you will, well, it's not the preferred terminology we use now, if there was a, a defect, then you would imagine that this barrier would be basically short-circuited as, as if it's not there. And therefore, I would not get quantum confinement and the device would not work. So back then, epitaxial growth technology was uh, fairly primitive in comparison to today. And so therefore, they th uh, so, um, so that's what, what uh, Ray Sue was trying to point out, is that um, they actually, because experimentally, it was very hard to realize that in the early, that RTD in the early 70s, they actually, their first paper they published was actually on the theoretical calculations theoretical prediction, and it took them nine more months to figure it out and publish the experiment. So they got credit for the theory, though, first. This is a hybrid device. I'm not going to go into it in great, great detail, but I can form all kinds of quantum wells now. I hope you're starting to see. And I could uh, do all kinds of funky things with different, putting different semiconductors together. I could form a quantum well here and a quantum well here, where I could also, over the top, have a PN junction so I have that band bending going on. And I can actually quantum mechanically tunnel from this quantum well, which is an electron quantum well, to this quantum well, which is a whole quantum well. And so I can also go through this process of, uh, of an end, a negative differential resistance. Or I can do this. This is a really wild um, uh, uh, device where I can have a whole quantum well state. And I can have this highly doped the Fermi level very high, and I can actually tunnel through this whole uh, state, and I can do, do, do it that way. And then at too high of an energy, it's going through this letter H. You can see, I hope you're starting to see our world a little bit. There's a lot of very interesting uh, kind of junctions that we can do. Here's another one where maybe we use delta doping to, to if we dope with a delta doping spike, where it's something like that 10 to the 21, and it's localized uh, a, f uh, a few atomic layers, like, like the delta uh, function that you may be familiar with, I can actually pull the, uh, uh, the, the, the band diagram down. It's like pulling this thread uh, down, and the Fermi level here, the red, the Fermi level is actually um, above the quantum well. So therefore, this quantum well is completely filled with electrons. This quantum well on, on the opposite side is completely filled with holes. And so I, quantum, I can quantum mechanically tunnel through that as well. And I can get my negative differential resistance. So I'm gonna, not going to go into too much. That's one of the uh, types of devices I work on, this Moore's Law is showing the scaling of devices that is problematic. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is use a modern day tunnel diode to develop a, a more compact and low power uh, memory uh, solution for a microprocessor. This is a multi-core microprocessor and we have a lot of cache memory that, um, uh, uh, that is near the microprocessor as, as memory is being swapped out. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to address with these. Um, uh, and this cache memory is six transistors of SRAM um, that I didn't quite finish getting to in lecture this morning, actually. But it's basically how you store a, 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 bin you know, a bit, one bit. So if you have these tunnel diodes, we can make memory latches. I actually have a poster outside my office that talks in a little more detail about this. And I can make a very simple storage node for a one or a zero by actually putting two tunnel diodes back to back. 
and it looks like this where I have an intersection of a zero and a one and but it all happens below half a volt and so normally CMOS circuitry is operating close to one volt near the band gap voltage of silicon and so this allows uh, very low uh, active power and standby power consumption or I can do all kinds of elegant things this is this is I can take a normal transistor a normal diode circuit and if I make a quantum version of it, if you will, quantum uh, circuitry using quantum devices, these quantum tunnel diodes, I can actually uh, take tr 12 transistors and six Schottky diodes, those the metal semiconductor diodes, and I can actually replace it with four devices, two tunnel diodes and two transistors. So I can actually go from a complex circuit to a simpler circuit, and it actually behaves more, um, uh, more appropriately with less parasitics. Or I can do voltage controlled oscillators with tunnel diodes and logic and Boolean logic and multi level logic and reconfigurable logic. Basically, having this, this unusual device that has a NDR, negative differential resistance, I can uh, fashion all kinds of. Because, again, I'll just emphasize one last point before I go to the next application. This. Um, because of the NDR, where it goes up, comes down, it provides two intersection points for one device. Think about any of the transistors or, di or conventional diodes we talked about. If I have a load line, and I know maybe you haven't formally learned about load line analysis and so forth, but if I do a load line analysis, I get one intersection point with this diode. So only this type of a diode, which is very unique, has the two intersection points and therefore providing a latch, a simple latch. And if you make a simple digital latch, you can build almost any circuit you want about that, around that. Okay, I think I'm ready for the next application. Uh, oh, yeah, this is, by the way, is our device that we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, patents and so forth that I'm working on. This is actually the band diagram of the device we've uh, invented and perfected. And that's what it looks like, and that's actually our experimental data that we did right here at Ohio State, by the way, with the Naval Research Laboratory. Um, this is some of the, you can see some of the things. I just threw a few slides from my uh, from my scientific talks, you can see this delta doping and, and the layer, this epitaxial layer. And this is one of what a, one of our high speed devices look like. It's with these metal pads and everything for very, very high frequency measurements. And this is the DUT. Basically, this is the device under test, DUT. So actually, that little diode is actually a little, little stub underneath this. And I think the uh, length scale disappeared. I forget, this might be one micron or so, this, this uh, electron microscope uh, bar. Looks like that disappeared somehow. And so uh, that peak to valley current ratio and that peak current density, those two figures of merit I declared, you can see these are the publications that our group here at Ohio State and uh, before I moved here at Delaware, um, uh, did. We basically were all around this parameter space, so it hits all different circuit applications. Probably the th uh, three best to kind of do this, uh, if you will, this Bermuda Triangle. Uh, we have the highest, and that was done here at Ohio State. We did the lowest at Ohio State, and we did this very high uh, peak current density one as well. So we basically, I mean, uh, peak to valley current ratio. So we basically can hit anywhere in that parameter space, depending upon circuit application. And here's one of the, this is a world record device that I don't think has been beaten yet for current density and switching speed and, and so forth. Here's some, I'll just, for eye candy, I threw this in, some other band diagrams and some things where we're doing small perturbations and you can see how we're making subtle changes to the quantum well and deepening the quantum well and you can see that makes the device better. Here we did things where he added, uh, we make the quantum main outside barriers. You can see we added a little layer there, a little layer there. So we actually make better electron confinement and whole confinement. There's so all kinds of things we can do. It's almost limitless. And so, you know, you, we've t I've talked a little bit about epitaxial growth techniques. This is uh, molecular beam epitaxy. We made this. 
And then I also have worked with collaborators and we've been able to technology transfer this to chemical vapor deposition. So this tends to be a university um, research tool platform, MBE, and CBD tends to be uh, what manufacturing uses. So let's, uh, you, uh, well, this is again eye candy, it just shows some collaborations where we actually made circuits out of this. Here's that PMOS, NMOS uh, aspect we were talking about in class, and here's, the, here's that diode, uh, that, that memory switch that we, this is the first device ever, uh, first monolithic circuit ever made, and it actually operates well below a half a volt. And so here's the truth table showing that. Anyway, uh, here's the whole uh, basis of what I've done over the last decade in this. And this is a very good book chapter. I actually put a copy of this book chapter on Carmen, so you can take a look at that, um, offering that for free. Next application, let's talk about solar cells. Okay, this is also one slide I cherry-picked from the talk I gave in Shanghai uh, when, we, when I, uh, uh, around spring break when we missed class. This is showing you the different families of semiconductor materials that are used to make solar cells. These are the high efficiency solar cells that are used in space applications. These are, uh, are a number of different technologies in the mid-range. These are the ones that you think about as solar energy farms that may be outside the city whenever you see these like, like uh, acres and acres of solar panels. They'll use this what they call thin film technology. It will predominantly be three types. It will predominantly be single crystal silicon or, um, or copper indium gallium disalinide here or cadmium telluride, uh, which is this one, which is predominantly first solar, by the way. First solar has a huge factory making solar cells up in Toledo, Ohio. And so these three are the major players competing against each other in the solar industry. Uh, the area that I work in actually are these plastic semiconductors, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, the world record right now is a plastic solar cell with 12% efficiency. These are fairly uh, recently, you can see this is a timeline showing the efficiencies as they increase over time. Um, so that con that's constantly needing to be updated as people post new world records. So I just want to remind you that as we, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, spectrum of radiation, here's a, right in this part, you expand, you see Roy G. Biv, and then we go into the uh, infrared and we go into the ultraviolet. So to ch hit those different wavelengths, um, and recognize that absorption, I kind of declared this once before, that uh, energy, photons going in to a semiconductor where this would be the surface and going into a semiconductor, there would be an attenuation of those photons going through, there would be an absorption. So it would be attenuated, it would fall e to the, mi to the minus alpha x. So this decay coefficient would be related to this attenuation coefficient alpha. And so any carriers, any, any photons coming in, such as this, a photon coming in, can excite an electron to jump up the band gap. We know that. Or an electron can be in an excited state and fall down, releasing a photon. We know that. This is the basis of a photodetector. This is the basis of a solar cell. This is the basis of a light emitting diode. This is the basis of a laser. And here is one photon in with an excited electron. That is the basis of stimulated emission from a laser, if you haven't seen that before. One photon in, passing by a, another, an excited carrier. So it's, right, it's, a, it's an electron up in the conduction band, so it's excited state. And two photons come out, and these two photons will be in phase with each other, re releasing coherent radiation. So this is the stimulated emission um, and the basis of a laser diode. Um, and so there's amplification of the light as it's going through. So I can hit those different wavelengths, Roy G. Biv, infrared, uh, ultraviolet, by going through the different band, uh, band gaps, the different semiconductor materials. So here you can see this quadrangle is representative of aluminum, 
gallium, arsenide, and tinamide is in this quadrangle. Or if I want to explore the um, uh, gallium, uh, indium, gallium, arsenide, uh, phosphide, uh, no, gallium, yeah, gallium, indium, gallium, arsenide, phosphide material system, it's in this, uh, not really, I wouldn't say a quadrilateral, but this, this bluish uh, boundary. And so that becomes some of the basis by which I could um, uh, module, you know, engineer my devices, band offsets, quantum wells, all that. Here you can see gallium arsenide substrate, here you can see indium phosphide substrate, you know, all those binary substrates that are possible. Okay, so here is the Uh, again, kind of Roy G. Biv, all the different band gaps possible. This data point, by the way, is wrong. It should be actually down here. But this shows you the nitride material system. Over here is mostly the arsenide, the phosphide, and antinamide material systems with a few others thrown in. And so here is the solar spectrum. The solar spectrum coming down from the, um, from the sun we have air mass zero. So this is, the sun, this is the sun's light that hits a satellite orbiting the Earth. So this is called air mass zero. And then when we have uh, the sun going through the atmosphere at the equator, we refer to it as going through an air mass of one. So any, uh, any sunlight coming through the atmosphere, and the atmosphere around the Earth is only about 100 miles uh, up. So uh, sunlight coming to the equator is kind of a normal incidence to the Earth, and so we call that air mass one. The one we care about here in the United States, in North America, is air mass 1.5, because if you look at the trigonometry, the way the sun comes in to North America, it's a slight oblique angle, right? North America is pointing kind of a little bit up, so if you look at the sunlight coming in from the equator, you get, we call it air mass 1.5. So this is, this is representative of the sunlight uh, in Ohio if we didn't have clouds or rain. And here you can see silicon band gap and its absorption in ga and uh, gallium arsenide band gap. So it tells you what is being absorbed. So actually silicon is a very good uh, solar cell it's absorbing everything from here on down. Anything above the band gap passes through unattenuated, no absorption. So you can see silicon actually captures more of the solar spectrum than gallium arsenide. So you can see uh, uh, one of the reasons. So here is the sunlight coming down, H nu, and essentially we go back to our diode and we talked about this linearly increasing with uh, increasing generation current as the depletion region opened up. Well, what if the depletion region was of a specified value? Let's say I want to operate it at minus five volts, but I shine light on it. Light will, ch will increase artificially the generation rate in or near the depletion regions through the absorption of the photon. So I go from no light to this diode, to a, a small amount of light, to a modest amount of light, and to a large amount of light. So I actually am moving the IV characteristics, this, I, this you know, diode IV characteristics, I'm actually moving it down by the addition of a reverse drift current that is stemming from the enhancement of the generation rate by the optical absorption of the external photons. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm having a photo current, is the term we use. So this is a photo-induced current, and it's intensity dependent, as you can see. So if we think of a di normal diode, like a silicon solar cell, and I apply a, um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, hit it with some light, I can actually cause this to induce also a volt voltage. And I don't know if you ever heard the term photovoltaics. This is because it's inducing a voltage across the solar cell, and we call it the open circuit voltage. And I'll define that a little more concretely uh, shortly. 
So this is the photo voltage induced by the absorption of light. It uh, actually causes a modification of the band gap by the generation of the carriers, which is not being shown here. So essentially, you have the photon coming in, modifying the bands because of the photo current. So the bands bend accordingly, inducing the photovoltage or the open circuit voltage. Essentially, think of it as photon coming in, hitting the solar cell diode, and that being driven to a load resistance, uh, whatever your, your equipment that you're trying to power. So you have this uh, photo-dependent um, current source, essentially, as the light comes in. And so that's kind of an equivalent circuit. So um, now what ends up happening is in the first quadrant in this uh, photo-induced uh, PN junction, uh, I don't get a whole lot of changes. My diode had an exponentially increasing current, and I have an exponentially increasing current here, too. So I don't have much going on in the first quadrant uh, when I absorb light. So usually you, know, you don't see anyone talk about that. No one cares about that. In the third quadrant, we have an increase in the photocurrent. We use this, where we bias this, we actually bias it into the reverse bias. We use that as a photodiode. And that's what's used for light wave communications. That's what's used for a data link if I want to use the remote control for this camera that's making this video recording. That camera has an, uh, a, a photo detector. And that photo detector probably has a few volts reverse bias. And when I shine this gallium arsenide LED that's inside that remote control, that silicon photodiode back there, even though it's in direct band gap, will still detect photons, will um, have a modulation in the photocurrent. And that can be measured by the circuit. Now, if I want to make a solar cell, I don't want to waste energy putting a bias on it. So um, the PN junction is just allowed to float. And so it actually makes me operate in the fourth quadrant. And so that induces this photovoltage, photovoltaic effect. And um, so, you know, solar cells, for instance, used uh, very uh, robustly on the space station and all that. Um, so this is what a solar cell tends to look like. It is just a PN junction. They do. By the way, they do a simple diffusion for silicon. They do a simple diffusion. The diffusions you calculated. So now you kind of know mathematically <clears throat> how to build a solar cell. I want to diffuse and make a PN junction. I want to make a metal contact to the end. But obviously, I need light to come down uh, without shadowing. These metal contacts that make Ohmic contact obviously shadow the, the sunlight. So they actually make this bus bar that you make contact to the external world, and they have these small fingers, so the light that's collected here, the, the current is, is being collected by these grids. So the grid sort of makes a connection. And remember we talked about diffusion length kind of being another form of recombination time or, uh, life, or carrier lifetime. So the grid spacing wants to be uh, consistent with the dif my, uh, minority carrier diffusion length. If I made these grids longer than the minority carrier diffusion length, then there would be carriers that would be absorbed in between, but would not make it all the way to the grid line. And until it makes it to the grid line, it's not collected and detected by the external circuit. So I have to know the quality of my semiconductor. I have to know the minority carrier diffusion length to know that my grid is appropriately spaced. I also probably want to put a nice anti-reflection coating on so I don't waste 30% of the light. That's an optics thing. Um, here's another kind of cross-sectional view. You have these grids. And here's the light coming down. And it's basically a PN junction. And essentially, they try to do this as simply and cheaply as possible. Um, one way, I'll tell you, uh, one way they do this is they need to add this metal line. And uh, when you do diffusion, um, 
I don't know if you caught, but often when we do a diffusion, we actually have accidentally, we sometimes form a little bit of SiO2 oxide on the top of the silicon by accident. So now I want to make a metal contact to the PN junction, but I have a glassy uh, SiO2 layer on the top, and I put metal onto glass, and the glass is on top of semiconductor, I have an open circuit. People have developed, companies have developed very special pastes uh, that a metal, a metal paste, it actually is screen printed. And the beauty of this that really started, one of, one of the things that started to bring the cost down in silicon solar cells is this, uh, this silt, maybe it might be silver paste. Um, this metal paste also acts as an acid etchant and it will actually etch through that SiO2 glassy layer at the surface. So you just screen print it on, it etches through the glass, and then eventually it gets neutralized. And when it uh, cures, you're left with the metal lines you want, grid lines. So all in one step, I have etched through the SiO2 and formed my grid lines. And so it's things, innovations like that that are helping propel the uh, silicon solar cell industry. This is the way uh, solar, uh, uh, solar cell people tend to look at the, uh, a solar cell. Essentially, it is the IV characteristics where this diode that came down like this, remember if it's photogenerated, if we have photogenerated light, this whole curve shifts downward, right, into the fourth quadrant. It's increasing with increasing light. So this is where we get the photovoltaic effect. We have a short circuit current, and up here we have the open circuit voltage, VOC. Solar cell people often will invert that fourth quadrant and flip it up to the first quadrant to make it a little easier to analyze. Here is your VOC, here is your I-short circuit, and then the maximum amount of, uh, of power we can deliver to the external circuit is bounded by the rectangle. This is the maximum voltage, this is the maximum current. So um, there is another terminology that they, call, they refer to as fill factor. And it's a ratio of this current voltage rectangle and the area under this curve. So essentially, to make a very efficient solar cell, they need to have a solar cell that has a very boxy, a very rectangular look to it in how it behaves. Because this and this is wasted energy. So they want to fill factor the ratio of these two areas to be as high as possible. So here you can see the maximum power rectangle on a particular um, candidate solar cell. And then when you flip it, it looks like that. Okay. Um, another way they sometimes might increase is they might take solar cells of different band gaps. And maybe in a very crude way, you could have different meters and the sunlight's coming through, and part of the solar spectrum shines onto one band gap. And then what is not uh, uh, reflected may pass unattenuated and hit the second mirror and reflect down onto a second band gap. And then this uh, reflects onto a third. Essentially, if I make a large stack of solar cells, maybe three, and this is made of a wider band gap material. This is a medium band gap. This is a low band gap. Sunlight coming through will go through the top and be absorbed. But the shorter, the, the, uh, the lower energy, uh, the, the, the smaller energy photons, which are actually longer wavelength, the smaller energy photons go through this as if it's a window like that SiO2 glass analogy I gave in class once, where I said glass is essentially nine electron volts. So it goes through this 
the, um, uh, the longer wavelengths, the smaller energies, and then it hits this. So this is like the papa bear, uh, mama bear, baby bear, essentially. And so I strip the uh, photons off as it goes through. And essentially, one way to make a highly efficient solar cell is to have a semiconductor material that takes this portion of the solar spectrum and have another one that is this portion of the solar spectrum and then have a third that's this portion of the solar spectrum. One of the reasons we do that is if we use one, then carrier, whether it's inefficient. If we have, it actually goes back to the band structure. The E versus K diagram. And if I have a photon of the band gap, the photon uh, absorbs, creating an electron hole pair that hopefully induces a photocurrent or a photovoltage. But if I have a photon of a higher energy than the band gap, I can absorb that too. But I absorb it at a higher energy. And then I said this once in class, I hope you, you kind of remember, I referred to this as being a thermalization. And it will fall down to the conduction band minimum. And I called this a thermalization. And it's releasing phonons, heat. Well, so therefore, I just declared it. I have an inefficient absorption because I'm accidentally generating heat, undesired heat. And I'm wasting photon energy into, uh, into this form of heat, of phone non-production. So by stitching three solar cells together as a tandem solar cell with three different band gaps, I can bypass that, and the energies that are absorbed in each of the three solar cells is around the band gap voltage. And I have very uh, less, you know, less of this uh, uh, inefficient process. So well, that's what they're trying to signify here. This is, this is a bad solar cell, by the way. If you have a very bad, you know, this is a good one with a very small shunt resistance. But let's say I take the solar cell and I uh, subject it to, uh, I put it up on a space station for a long time, or I cook it in the, uh, in the um, uh, Kuwait desert for a while. Um, it may actually um, start to degrade and I may get this shunt resistance and it's basically I'm, I'm having a shunt resistance and I'm losing that fill factor. I'm losing my ability, my, my efficiency. So this is um, uh, solar cells with the resistances. They do all kinds of interesting things to improve solar cell efficiency. Here they're making this uh, perforated grid and all it basically is causing is that the light is coming through the device and ricocheting all over. There's reflections all over this, this geometric surface because the light coming through, now this happens to be more for a silicon solar cell. Um, the silicon solar cell may be somewhat thin because I want to save on raw materials because that's a big cost for, uh, for the solar cell. And I want to make this very thin so therefore, some light can come through and come through the other side without being absorbed. But if I put this grid on there, then light is being ricocheted, and if light is coming through laterally, or somewhat laterally, I increase my path length, and I increase my absorption probability. Um, here's some others. Solar cells connected with, uh, uh, well, this is, uh, Oh, here's the, here's the tandem solar cell, by the way, where they might use a uh, top junction of gallium and new phosphide, a, uh, a middle junction of uh, gallium arsenide, and uh, this one, I, I think there was another one. Uh, no, I, I think, um, oh, this is inactive substrate. Uh, let me see, high, low junction, gallium arsenide, gallium and phosphide, uh, usually, it's, usually it's germanium, gallium arsenide, and gallium and phosphide. But anyway, this is, 
This is a, maybe this is a double junction. Um, photo detectors. So photo detector was the device that is operated with a reverse bias. So it's over here in the third quadrant. So photo detectors are operating in the third quadrant, independent of voltage, because we know that this is going to be somewhat flat um, and proportional to the optical generation rate. We just declared that. So usually the speed is of importance. If I want to make a 10 gigabit data link from here to Washington, D.C., I need a photo detector that can operate at 10 gigahertz. So it has to be very, very fast. So I want the photo generated minority carriers to uh, must diffuse in the junction and be swept away very quickly. So I can't have um, before a next pulse comes in, you know, because my optical signal going from here to, to Washington, D.C. is a series of binary uh, pulses. Right. And I think you may have learned about um, RC time constants. So essentially, I want my digital ones and zeros to be detected as zeros, uh, ones and zeros. But if I have a slow, sloppy diode, then this may slowly ramp up through the RC time constant. It may slowly, you probably did a circuit lab like this. And so it becomes sort of this so what if this is so sloppy that it hasn't quite gotten up? I can corrupt this, distort that signal so badly that I lose the integrity of my digital signal. So I need this RC time constant, in other words, my capacitance, RC, usually it's into a 50 ohm load. So if the capacitance were modulating, I need the capacitance to be very small. So I need a small diode. Uh, so I need to also eliminate any diffusion current, so uh, uh, that also slows things down. So I want the electron hole pairs to be created within the depletion region, so I want the electric field to sweep them away very, very quickly. And that's why we're operating in the reverse bias third quadrant. So I only have the reverse bias drift current. So the electron hole pairs are swept away very quickly by the uh, uh, electric field at, and a very short time. And if I increase the W, um, if I increase the W, I think I showed this briefly. No, that's not the one. If I increase the W, I showed this once before, but I'll just briefly show it again. If I make a PIN diode and a form junction, I have a depletion region that's, that's uh, spatially separated, where I have P and N, or N and P, I'm not quite, I haven't, uh, uh, let's see if that's plus, the, this is the minus side. So this is the N. So this is a PN junction. Here's the depletion regions, but in here is an intrinsic or undoped semiconductor. So the electric field becomes this uh, quadrilateral, and uh, therefore I've always emphasized the terminology that the generation current here is uh, the, you know, the drift current is the generation current that is forefashioned in or near the depletion region. Now I've stretched my depletion region so I have a larger collection volume. So therefore I have a better photodiode for detecting so a better signal to noise ratio for my photodiode. So uh, that's what's happening here. I increase the W, increase the depletion region using the PIN so it's surrounded by highly doped, and that's called a PIN diode I just showed. So that can exhibit uh, gain, actually, in some cases. If you actually operate in the avalanche mode, you can actually create an a, a avalanche photodiode where a single photon, they actually can make a single photon detector. If they operate this very, uh, very highly in the avalanche region, a single photon can come in and through the uh, avalanche multiplication process could make, be make 
a hundred or a thousand carriers that could be collected. So uh, we can use wide band gap material for the NP regions, kind of like that quantum well. Uh, and so we can allow the light to get down to the I region. And this is a little more clear. Uh, you can go ahead and read that on your own. I'm not uh, kind of going to go into great detail for uh, time's sake, but noise and bandwidth are important parts for photodiodes. Uh, gain bandwidth product and so forth, and here's some of the noise uh, characteristics. I think we're not going to have time to go into great detail for this, but we have different kinds of noise by shot noise and avalanche photodiode, uh, uh, different noises here. Um, but these heterostructures can be used very effectively. And um, um, yeah, here's the photodiodes talking about uh, the optical photon. So when I talk about the uh, absorption is occurring in or near the junction, this is the optical generation rate. You know, the light, this is basically indicative of the light uh, intensity. And it's um, create, or the generation rate of the optical absorption, actually, is what this is. is. And this is the in or near. So here you can see one diffusion length on the P side, one diffusion length on the N side, plus the W in my PIN junction. And that relates to the photocurrent, the optically induced photocurrent. Um, and you can see that typically absorption coefficient is about uh, 10 to the 4 inverse centimeters. So if alpha is about 10 to the 4, then for e to the minus alpha x, this attenuation of, of light penetrating a, a semiconductor, I really need to make a photodiode about 1 micron thick to get to allow 37% to be unabsorbed. So you can see here's the uh, calculations of a, of, a, of a diode and how you can create the uh, photocurrent. Here's the uh, open circuit voltage, by the way. And uh, so you can see the open circuit voltage, open circuit voltage for a solar cell is limited by the band gap voltage. We kind of explained that in the diode uh, when we talked about deviations from ideality and when we hit that knee. Uh, so uh, that's the photo absorption. Here's the PIN. This is a cross section of it and this is the band diagram. You can see that I have a constant electric field uh, and so carriers generated, all the electrons are collected, all the holes are collected. So it has a PIN where this is a big intrinsic absorption zone. And here's that alpha. So as this goes, oops, as the light goes more deeply into this PIN, you can see here's the attenuation, e to the minus alpha x. So it's, a, it's a attenuating by this attenuation factor alpha. Okay, so here's a metal semiconductor diode. If I want to make a fast photodetector, I can sometimes use a Schottky diode here. This is a semi-transparent metal layer. And uh, so here's a typical silicon avalanche photodiode. What it looks like, P substrate, uh, these epilayer and the anti-reflection coating on the surface. And this is what the absorption looks like, the function of wavelength. It has quantum efficiency, it peaks as they get to a certain energy, and then it starts to fall off. So here's the difference. Let me go to zoom to page level. Um, so this is the different, um, depending upon different band gap semiconductors, you're absorbing different wavelengths. So here's gallium, indium, arsenide, phosphide, here's germanium, here's gallium arsenide, here's silicon. Uh, cadmium cellulite, uh, uh, sulfide. So you can see different detectors, photo detectors for different applications. Um, by the way, notice, notice how the silicon has a soft edge, whereas the gallium arsenide is very abrupt. Um, germanium tends to be a softer edge here. Uh, that's indicative of the indirect band gap, if you think about it, and how the indirect band gap absorbs its softer edge. Um, so here's another way to think about it, quantum efficiency, uh, uh, zinc sulfide, silicon, silicon, gallium, indium arsenide, indium antinamide, indium arsenide. You see, if I go to indium antinamides, 
indium arsenides, I can go out into the far infrared. So sometimes these might be used uh, not only in, in telescopes, but it might be used in heat seeking, you know, detecting someone at border patrol or, you know, security or raiding Osama bin Laden's, you know, zero dark 40. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or no, zero dark 30, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, going through the dark, you're going to be looking at the thermal imaging of, of uh, warm bodies out at the five to eight microns. Uh, some of them do not have to be cryogenically cool. This is indicative of liquid nitrogen. Some, some do not. Um, so here you can see another PIN sort of thing, uh, d device where the light's coming through. Here they're using a wide band gap indium phosphide. So that allows the light to go through the indium phosphide, which provides the uh, electrical connection. But the actual area that's being absorbed is the indium gallium arsenide more deeply in the, in the device. Here's the absorption region. And we can do things where we can have an absorption region and a multiplication region separate from each other. And what I mean by that is this. By tailoring the doping, I can tailor the electric uh, field profile in the device, and I can tailor the band gaps and, the, and how these are potentially grown. So I can actually absorb here, and then I can have deeper into the device, I can have a high electric field region, which is where the multiplication happens. And actually, if I separate this, this is called a SAM APD, separate avalanche multiplication avalanche photodiode, SAM APD. And I can actually get a very high signal to noise ratio, a very uh, high detect detectivity by having absorption in one region and multiplication in a different region. This is kind of what I mean by multiplication. If I have a crazy sawtooth band diagram, I can do all kinds of crazy things with modern technology. I can have this crazy sawtooth. So when I put it in reverse bias, remember a photodiode is used in reverse bias, it flips. It's like something out of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And all of a sudden, the steps disappear here. And here I have uh, steps for the electrons. So as the electrons fall off this cliff, they're turning potential energy into kinetic energy. And with that, it picks up enough kinetic energy, I can stimulate an avalanche multiplication process. So every time it falls off, I can actually multiply the electron. But the hole is floating up and never actually gets um, enhanced. That is, seems maybe a bit contrary, but if I can multiply one carrier type versus the other, I can actually uh, keep a very high signal to noise ratio um, because the avalanche multiplication of the electron and the hole together simultaneously is so statistically random it scrambles the noise, uh, it scrambles the, the signal and makes it very noisy. Um, so then here's another avalanche photodiode that's very high frequency. I'm going to bump this up to 60 I guess. Yeah, it's a little better. So you can look at this, there's a whole epitaxial layer sequence. This happens to also operate at high frequency. Uh, Shocky diodes, if you remember, Shocky diodes, metal semiconductor diodes are unipolar devices. They, um, if you remember, they were, they were majority carrier devices. They didn't have that PN junction minority carrier storage, storage that we just drew. So metal, semiconductor metal photodiodes are two back-to-back -back shock keys. It consists of a semiconductor absorbing layer on which two interdigitated electrodes are on top. And they and they form two back-to-back -back shock key diodes. The beauty of this, the advantage, is it's very easy to fabricate on any planar material, meaning I don't have to figure out how to dope it, P and N. It has a compatibility with transistors. It's able to posit on any material uh, and there's a lot of semiconductor materials that have been customarily hard to dope, and it's a majority carrier device. And so uh, this can be very, very uh, fast, but the Schottky barrier height can be problematic. So this is what a device looks like. We use, I, my group used to work on this a long time ago. It looks like this. This is one of our devices we built. 
And band diagram wise, this is more or less what it looks like. You have metal, metal, shock key barrier, shock key barrier, and the electrons are just flowing in between this simple undoped semiconductor material. And this is what some of the devices look like. And it just basically goes from a back-to-back shaky -back diode. So it's two back-to-back -back diodes because of the two metals. And if I shine light on it, then I induce a photo current. And essentially, the electric field is I have one set of electrodes being zero volts ground, and the other ones coming in might be 10 volts. So I actually have an electric field that's going laterally rather than vertically like a normal photodiode. So this actually has very low capacitance. In the, in the photodiode, we're worried about RC time constant capacitance. If you think about the electrostatics of two pieces of metal that are flat, very, very thin, and instead of being a capacitor like this, they're like this, on end on end, there's actually very little uh, capacitance from this to this. They don't talk to each other much. So, uh, so it has a very low capacitance. This is some work we did and how it looks. Uh, I'll just throw, we used some uh, transparent, instead of metal, we used some, some uh, transparent conductors. And here you can see, as we bias it, we can go from a metal, uh, a metal semiconductor, an MSM photodiode with metal, and we can get 16.7 microwatts out. But if we use a transparent conductor, we can get more energy out, more current. It was an old piece of research where basically I'm going from a metal that shadows the active region to something that's transparent. Okay, I think uh, I have more to cover, but I think I'm going to stop and we'll talk about fiber optic communication maybe in a future class, future makeup video. Yeah, I think everyone's uh, hitting their limit. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, uh, a little bit about fiber optics, but where I'm going next, is the last two installments is light emitting diodes and laser diodes. And uh, if you're still in uh, a funk about the uh, 980 pump laser, look ahead in the slide deck. You're going to see some, some quantum well laser diodes. Not the solution to your problem, but it may give you some further insight. So take a look at the rest of this PowerPoint if you like tonight. But um, I'll try and get Sarah to post this as soon as possible. I'm going to let her know right after I leave, uh, leave here. So thank you for your long attention. I really appreciate it. Um, but I kind of wanted to get that on video because it's a nice uh, summation of all our junctions. So thank you.